uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you uh, about this bill. Uh, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I uh, received my training at the University of Michigan, uh, and I am chairman of the Department of OBGYN, where I practice both as a general OBGYN and as a high-risk obstetrician. Uh, I've been at the University of Michigan for 20 years. Uh, prior to that, I was chief of obstetrics at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, I'm involved both in patient care personally uh, and in patient care at the University of Michigan, uh, where we have a residency training program with uh, 24 residents, fellowship training programs, and obviously our training medical students. I have extensive experience in comprehensive women's health, and uh, including OB and uh, MGYN, and uh, as most of the members of my faculty, I practice uh, comprehensive women's health. I come today to speak uh, in opposition to this bill, and like uh, Mr. Rabbit, I almost don't know where to begin, uh, because there are, in fact, a million and one points uh, in this bill that are problematic. I want to focus on a couple of issues. First of all, this bill uh, is a problem for physicians because it interferes with their ability to practice medicine uh, as they wish. There's language in this bill uh, that restricts our ability to provide uh, services uh, in terms of medical abortion, in terms of optimal patient for our patient uh, care. The bill also interferes with the doctor-patient relationship in interesting ways and it mandates uh, certain interactions between patients uh, that are problematic. And uh, I'll give an example of that. Um, the, dis the, dis the, uh, the language about uh, coercion, uh, which uh, is, an, is an issue that I think is important uh, to recognize. And I, uh, like everyone in this room, am, am totally opposed to, uh, to any abortion that, uh, that might be coerced. But I need to point out, first of all, that in terms of domestic violence and abuse in this state, women are much more likely to be co coerced by abusive partners to have a pregnancy uh, than they are to have an abortion. Uh, within uh, within a, an abusive relationship. Having said that, let me just give an example. On page 34, there's specific language that the bill, bill describes uh, requiring that a physician, at, at a minimum, orally ask a patient if her husband, parents, siblings, relatives, or employer, the father or putative father of the fetus, the parents of the father or putative father of the fetus, or any other individual has engaged in coercion to abort the pregnancy. Let me give you an example of a 42-year-old woman who comes to see me who has diabetes and hypertension uh, and uh, who, upon discussion, recognizes that uh, this pregnancy causes significant risk uh, to her health and her life and that the pregnancy could potentially lead to her death. She makes a difficult decision uh, on medical grounds to have an abortion. And at that point, I have to ask her whether she has been coerced by her husband, her parents, her siblings, her relatives, her employer, the father of putative father of the fetus, parents of the father, etc., etc. Clearly, it's an inappropriate discussion at that level to be had between a doctor and a patient who's making a very, very private decision. This bill, first of all, uh, is overbroad. It's so uh, expansive, it covers so many topics, many of which, in small parts, many of, almost all of us in this room would be supportive of. Uh, but uh, the overbreadth uh, will cause significant problems for the physicians in this state. Uh, the, design, the requirement that all physician offices who provide abortion services uh, become freestanding operative facilities, uh, it would really have a chilling effect across the state. One of the things that we're trying to do in this state is make abortions safe. And we know that the safest abortions are early abortions, and we can now do early abortions at six to seven weeks with medical therapy in doctor's offices without any requirement for surgery. If patients are being treated with medications in their offices, why should those offices be required to be registered as freestanding operating facilities when there are no operations going on within those facilities and where the patients are getting optical medical management of a problem and to manage a decision that's very difficult for them? Uh, the issue of uh, fetal tissue disposition uh, is an important one, and I would agree that human tissue needs to be treated respectfully. But the requirement that all fetal tissue uh, prior to incineration uh, be approved by the local medical examiner uh, is really problematic. Uh, this bill is so overbroad in the discussion around disposition of fetal tissue and so confusing with the language uh, between fetal tissue, fetal parts, fetal disposition, uh, products of conception, that it would basically require uh, any time a doctor recognizes that there's abortion prior to that tissue being incinerated in an appropriate medical fashion that uh, not only the doctor, but even the funeral home uh, where this tissue might go would have to uh, contact the medical examiner, and I think that's, a, uh, that's a, an undue burden 
uh, both for the patient uh, and for the physician and for the nursing home. The two other issues that, uh, that I would say is that the bill is extremely vague. Many of the, de the definitions are unclear. Uh, this definition of, uh, of medical abortion, for example, is not exactly clear. And the definition, one of the other, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, the, the definition of advertising for, out, for outpatient abortions. I'm not exactly clear what it means to advertise doing outpatient abortions. If I say I provide comprehensive OBGYN care, I think that's a signal that I'm providing comprehensive service that might include medical abortion. And, and, and the bill is, is so kind of specific that if somebody said I provide abortions, and they don't say that they provide outpatient abortions, they might be able to avoid uh, being, being uh, in violation of the bill. So it's just, it's just unclear, vague, and, and not appropriate. Finally, in many portions of the bill, there's no health exception. A complicated patients that I see at the University of Michigan Hospital, where their health might be significantly impacted by this bill, uh, have significant risks to their health. And at many points in this bill where there are discussions uh, about medical abortion, surgical abortion, and other activities, uh, discussions between doctors and patients, uh, there may be a, a life exception, but, but no health exception. We know that uh, in this country, we hold the health of women in, in, in addition to the lives of women at the highest level. Uh, so uh, the last comment I would make is this kind of legislation discourages physicians from coming uh, to the state of Michigan. We actively try to recruit physicians to our OBGYN residency training programs. We try to recruit people to come to this state. The large number of people who are going into OBGYN these days are women, and those women are interested in providing comprehensive services to women that includes the entire scope of OBGYN care. If we try to restrict that care, then we have a potential for, uh, for reducing our ability to recruit the kind of people we want to this state. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Representative Siegel? Thank you, Madam Chair, and Doctor, thank you very much for your testimony. You got to my question at the very end there about what this would do to our supply of OBGYN at the end of the day if this legislation passed. I know in my community there are not enough OBGYNs to see the current number of pregnant women in my community, and I can't imagine this legislation going through and further putting the risk of the women in my community at health. So thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Doctor. Could you um, speak to the million dollar coverage um, um, in terms of the likelihood that someone could get a million dollars and what that cost may or may not be and how that relates to your last statement of attracting doctors to, to this? Yeah, I mean, we know from, from data that, that those states uh, that are so-called red states by the American College of OBGYN that have very high liability requirements are a disincentive, and the doctors actually leave states when uh, increased liability uh, coverage is, is required. So this, again, that, there are several portions of this bill, and there's so many little things in this bill that, that, uh, that, uh, that affect physician practice and physician behavior in so many different ways uh, that it's very problematic. Well, I guess I needed, when I was practicing anesthesia, we paid about $40,000 per member, yeah. and I just... So the malpractice coverage for somebody in that kind of a range, with a $1 million, $5 million coverage in this state, would range anywhere from $70,000 a year, oh. maybe as high as $180,000 a year for malpractice coverage, if they could get that malpractice coverage. And that's the issue I wanted to hit on, is that oftentimes they won't give it to you either. Um, and it's certainly cost prohibitive. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Representative. Representative Shirky. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, pursuing this question, line of questions regarding insurance. So, why why is it it may be difficult for them to get somebody to secure a million dollars of coverage? Well, there are two issues. One is that the coverage is expensive, and they might not be able to to cover that. And no, I was asking the access to it, not the cost of it. The, the access. Yeah. Well, I mean, you implied you implied that they not may may not be available. Not, I'm we'll talking about the affordability at the moment. We're just talking about the availability. Of well, it, it might be difficult for somebody who wants to have a certain type of practice and practice, for example, exclusively in an outpatient in a freestanding operating center where, where the practice was limited to, to abortion, to even find an insurance company that would give them the insurance. Why? Insurance companies aren't. I mean, the, the line of business simply doesn't make sense for them. Why? It, that's a, that's a, that, I mean, I think there are lots of different reasons. It, it may be because they don't want to cover that line of, uh, of activity. It may be because they don't cover freestanding operating facilities. It may be because the, an individual physician 
might have uh, might have had previous uh, malpractice coverage. There may be a variety of different reasons why. Why they, might they not want to cover that kind of procedure? Why might they not want to cover this procedure? I think that I mean they're making insurance companies make decisions based on risk and potential risk. Ah, uh -huh. risk. risk. Thank you for making that clear. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Matthew Allswede, uh, and um, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Michigan section of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and take the opportunity to um, educate uh, the committee on the unintended consequences of this package of legislation. Uh, I am um, also uh, a trainee of the University of Michigan. Uh, I've been a practicing obstetrician gynecologist here in the Lansing area uh, since 1993. I'm uh, deeply involved in uh, training of uh, future generations of obstetricians and gynecologists and, and the uh, residency program director at Sparrow Hospital a few blocks up the street. And the most important message I want you to take from my testimony is that unrestricted access to comprehensive women's health services is vital to prevent pregnancy-related deaths in Michigan women. The category of pregnancy complications is the sixth leading cause of death in American women aged 20 to 24, and the seventh leading cause of death in all other women between the ages of 15 and 34. Michigan women need access to obstetrician gynecologists to help reduce their risk of serious health-related complications related to pregnancy. In 2004, Michigan's maternal mortality ratio ranked the 42nd worst in the country and was rated unsatisfactory. A 2010 report by the Michigan Department of Community Health identified that 21 of the 83 counties in Michigan lacked even one OBGYN provider. OBGYN recruitment and retention will need to be a priority if Michigan is to make significant improvements in its excessive maternal mortality rate. Now legislation that imposes capricious fines, civil litigation, and criminal sentences related to pregnancy services will deter OBGYNs from choosing to work in the state and will further reduce Michigan women's access to quality obstetrical care. House Bill 5711 would create Section 2836, which would subject Michigan physicians to a felony charge of up to three years in prison and a fine of $5,000 for failure to follow new administration requirements for the disposition of fetal remains from an elective abortion, but not from a miscarriage. It would also create Section 2854, which would subject Michigan physicians to an additional civil infraction and fine of $1,000 per occurrence for violating Section 2836 or by failing to obtain proper authorization for disposition of a miscarriage, and it encourages the initiation of civil litigation against the physician for violating subsection 1 of Section 2854. So Representative Shirky, if you're wondering why obstetrician gynecologists may have difficulty finding a million dollars of liability coverage, because it's open season on this. House Bill 5713 would create Section 324, which would subject Michigan physicians to a felony charge of up to 15 years in prison and a fine of $7,500 for terminating any pregnancy of 20 or more weeks post-fertilization unless the death of the mother was imminent. Now I ask you, what physician would want to offer his or her services to a pregnant woman in the process of miscarrying or in need of a health-preserving termination of a pre-viable pregnancy if it meant exposing him or herself to this kind of legal and financial jeopardy. House Bill 5711 also creates Section 17019, which imposes the burdensome requirement for the $1 million of professional liability coverage if an OBGYN performs five abortions or in a month and has also been subject of two civil lawsuits within the preceding seven years related to harm caused by abortions, regardless of the status or outcome of the litigation. Again, why don't insurance companies want to uh, cover OBGYNs? This is an onerous obligation that is not required for other procedures within the specialty of OBGYN or any other surgical specialty that I'm aware of. Under this rule, an OBGYN who provides abortion services to his or her 
established patients might face the professional dilemma of denying the procedure to a woman if that doctor had already performed five procedures in that month. It would also invite the frivolous lawsuits by those whose agenda it is to restrict access to safe legal abortion services in Michigan. Now, what message does that send to OBGYN providers who want to work or stay in our state? Legislation that interferes with the doctor-patient relationship uh, will reduce the likelihood that women will seek important medical guidance during their pregnancy and increases their likelihood of suffering from serious preventable pregnancy complications. Now, the conversations between physicians and patients are held in strict confidence because of the sensitive nature of many topics and because of the importance of full disclosure to facilitate accurate diagnosis and consideration of appropriate interventions. This is similar to the privileged discussions held between attorneys and clients and clergy and parishioners. Without the tacit understanding that outside interference is proscribed, the frank communication essential to these professional relationships would be inhibited and would hamper the effectiveness of any interaction. Requiring physicians to perform a scripted screening interview dictated by the state during a professional discussion of such great sensitivity and also requiring those responses to be documented in a prescribed format in the medical record encroaches upon the doctor-patient relationship in a manner that impacts not only that encounter but future interactions as well. The knowledge that an honest response to the doctor <laughs> could result in a child protective service evaluation or a report leading to a criminal charge carrying a $5,000 penalty is more than enough to discourage some patients from discussing their situation candidly and may lead them to treat other parts of the medical interview with similar contempt. For OBGYNs who are willing to tolerate the legal risks of providing obstetric care in Michigan, the preservation of the autonomous doctor-patient relationship is essential to maximize the impact on maternal mortality reduction. To do otherwise would further restrict the effectiveness of a team that is currently understaffed to meet the health needs of the women in Michigan. So in summary, the legislation before the committee today, if enacted, will negatively impact the health and welfare of Michigan women and therefore should be rejected. The provisions in this package of bills serve the interests of a special interest group at the expense of the female constituents of the state of Michigan and their families. As a representative of the state's health care providers for women, the Michigan section of ACOG recommends that this legislation be withdrawn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Rebecca Master, Michigan Catholic Council. I really didn't have the right to do this. But as a person of faith, I strongly Excuse oppose. Excuse me, sir. One moment. There will be no clapping in this committee room. Thank you. As a person of faith, I strongly oppose the proposed legislation for several reasons. And I'm not going to speak as a doctor or a woman, I'm going to speak more broadly. There is no evidence to support the assertion that human personhood begins at conception or even in the first trimester until the unborn child loses its prehensile tail and stops representing a tadpole more than a human and displays independent mental capacity that is merely a potential human being. Until that, be, in that time, the decision to continue or discontinue the pregnancy should lie with the mother, who in the end is the person most affected by the decision morally and medically. At a time when millions of unwanted children are hungry and unable to get proper, proper medical care, when thousands of families are joining the ranks of the homeless while bankers profit off their misery, while we murder innocent children in endless wars in foreign lands, while laying off public school teachers and closing schools, we have far more important work to do than further oppressing women and their doctors from making informed choices in the best interests of the woman. Any legislation that requires a woman who is the victim of rape or incest to carry to term the enduring burden of that heinous violence is nothing short of cruel and abusive behavior. I cannot even begin to imagine how it feels for a stranger or even worse a trusted relative to violate my most private and personal core being and then to be prevented by my elected officials from getting the medical treatment I want from physicians willing to provide it. I cannot even imagine the feeling of that invasion for nine long months, all the time risking my health and increasing my lifelong risk of a myriad of diseases. 
If you justify this proposed legislation on religious beliefs, only a convoluted interpretation of the scriptures of any religion would ascribe such a scenario as desirable by a loving God. Respectfully, until you pass laws making birth control widely available and comprehensive sex education mandatory, you have no moral right to legislate the consequences of their absence. If you truly care about children, then feed the boys and girls we already have. Give them the medical care they deserve. Provide them the schools and education they need so that they don't ever have to make this decision regarding terminating a pregnancy. Find jobs for their parents so their families can stay healthy and strong. People of faith stand on the side of love. And loving means giving people the resources and the opportunity to make their own informed choices, not imposing government-sanctioned moral codes. People who believe that a fertilized egg has a soul have the option to reject abortion. Every woman deserves the opportunity to make that choice based on her personal theology. This proposed legislation is a violation of our time-honored separation of church and state, and I urge you to reject its continuation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Hooker. This past Friday, at an abortion clinic at Fulton Street in Grand Rapids, a young lady was taken in by her mother. She was there a short time, mother left, and emergency units and fire department and E-unit people showed up. She was taken out on a stretcher as the result of an abortion. The abortions were taking place that day. That clinic is not inspected. That clinic is not licensed. There is nobody who double checks to make sure that it's treated as a clinical outpatient surgical unit and surgery is taking place. Do you not want women protected in that way to have the, those places inspected and licensed? I want a compassionate government. I want any woman, regardless of their economic status, their color, anything, to be able to get a safe and healthy abortion wherever they live. And that doesn't mean restricting the ability to get abortions. It means making them more available and more safe. And do you believe that that should be paid for with our tax dollars? I believe all good health care should be paid for by our tax dollars. Yeah. So in other words, I should pay for something that I believe is murder. I pay taxes to support war in Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. That is murder too. Thank you. Next question. I've tried not to say a whole lot as I listen to the testimony, but you know, I spent Sunday at a Tiger baseball game with my grandson, who's four years old and we had a ball. And to listen to you tell me he's no better than a tadpole when I look at his ultrasound. It's the most uncompassionate testimony and the most gross testimony I have heard in my five and a half years here in Minnesota. I reject everything you say today, and I'm extraordinarily upset. Is there a question there? Yeah. We'll take a brief recess.
You seemed very upset there, and I'm wondering where you... Uh... Comparing my grandson's ultrasound to a tadpole is gross, misleading, and wrong. He didn't I'm compare very, the Yes, he did. He said the womb, the fetus, is nothing better than a tadpole. That's a quote. Yes, but he wasn't talking about ultrasound. I was, but I see my grandson in my daughter-in-law's <coughs> womb as a fetus, and that ultrasound is a picture of that. He said that's a tadpole. I think that's wrong. Is it that's my quote. Is it appropriate to berate a witness at a public hearing? Only when he calls my grandson a tadpole. When does life start for you? At the sperm level? It's too high. It's too high. up House Bill 5711 sponsored by Representative Brendan. I have offered an amendment to House Bill 5711. This amendment is a technical fix. It changes language in the section on coercive abortion to mirror the language that has already come out of Families, Children, and Seniors Committee. After we vote on this bill, I will then read in the white cards that have been presented and time allowing, we will have more testimony. I ask for a motion to adopt the amendment. Moved by Representative Her Hooker. Clerk, please call the roll. To amend House Bill 5711. Yes. Representative Carlton. Yes. 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 Wayne Smith. Yes. Tucker? Yes. 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 Knox Yes. 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 Okay, before me I have just been given an amendment from Representative Siegel. Do I have a motion for this amendment? I make a motion, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative, uh, clerk, Can I please explain the amendment. Sure. Just because it took me a while to get to this bill. Since um, page nine, a person who suffers injury or damage as a result of this act can bring a civil cause of action against a person to get the damages, including damages for emotional distress or other appropriate relief. My amendment would add um, any use of taking a medication that was approved by the Federal Food and Drug Administration and withdrawn from the market and give people the right to collect civil damages for that as well. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. No. Representative Clausen? No. Absent? No. Kurt? No. Ben Schmitz? No. Sherpa? No. Parker? No. Pokey? No. Maxwell? No. Yanker? No. Hughes? No. Gray? No. Riff? Yes. Stallwood? Yes. Durani? Yes. Siegel? Yes. Walmart? Yes. Right. Yes. Brandon. Yes. Madam Chair, there are seven yeas, 12 nays, zero passes. The motion does not prevail. 
Thank you. Seeing no further amendments, I ask for a motion to report House Bill 5711 as amended from the committee with recommendation. Moved by Representative Hooker. Clerk, please call the roll. 